right. I want to welcome all of you to our Polar Connect event. We're really excited today to be talking with a team that is up in Tulik Field Station, Alaska. It's June 20th, 2018, and I'm going to let Melissa in a little bit introduce who uh, the researchers that are with her today, Dr. Jeremy May and Matthew Simon, but she'll talk more about them and what they're doing here in just a moment. Um, while they're swatting mosquitoes, I will go through these next little bits of slides and talk about how this presentation is going to work. So hopefully you see them in the webcam. And again, um, it's just going to be a web view of the research team. You can see the attendees on uh, just below the web camera. There's a public chat, and that's the area that you're going to be typing in your questions and any comments. Um, you should be seeing slides change as we go through the presentation today in the center of the screen. This event is being archived, and we will have the archive available in a couple of days on the website and send a link out to everyone that registered. And if you didn't register, um, don't worry about it. It will be on the website, and you'll be able to achieve it or achieve it, get it. <laughs> Goodness. Uh, anyway, um, while I'm talking, we hope that you'll introduce yourself in the chat area. Um, tell us where you're from, um, if you have anybody listening with you. Um, it's always good for the team to find out who's with the, who's joining them virtually. A little bit about why Melissa is in Tulip Field Station, Alaska. So Melissa is part of a program called Polar Trek, which I'm sure you are all finding your way through our website or heard about a little bit online. Um, it is hosted by a nonprofit, the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, or ARCIS. We are in Fairbanks, Alaska, and we also have staff that virtually work um, around or telecommute around um, from a variety of places around the United States. Judy, who's on here as well, and myself, Janet, we administer the Polar Trek program. And our goal is to place teachers like Melissa with researchers like Jeremy and Matthew in the field so that she can learn about what's going on in the world of polar science and bring that back into the classroom. And we do put teachers both in the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, so, Oh, a little bit about questions. Uh, we might ha have the ability to do some live questions at the end here, but you can always type in your questions as we go along. And we will relay them to the team so they don't have to pay attention to the chat um, while they're presenting. And it is also very important that while the presentation is going on, you keep your microphones muted. Um, there's a little microphone at the top uh, gray area above um, the slide, and you can press that, and you might get a red line through it. Judy and I will also mute you if we hear excessive background noise. I think that's it. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Melissa to introduce her team. Thanks. Um, I'm Melissa Lau, and I'm from Piedmont, Oklahoma. Teach in Piedmont, Oklahoma. Teach sixth grade science. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to actually let my research team, my research team, no thought I should have that. I'm going to let the research team kind of talk for a little bit, and then I'll come back in and talk a little bit more about the, the daily life um, uh, here at the station and in Barrow. Um, but behind me is Matthew Simon, and uh, he'll, he'll introduce himself here in a minute. And this is Dr. Jeremy May, and he's going to start us off. Good. Um, so I'm Jeremy May, and I've worked so, yeah, so Jeremy, um, there are yes. some people that are having a hard time hearing, and so you guys are going to okay. have to, like, yeah, talk right into your computer, and probably just one of you. And... All right, I can get in. Okay. Perfect. So, my name is Jeremy May, and I've worked in the Arctic for 11 years now, and specifically on this project for the past four. And so, some of the interests that I have are understanding the factors that affect plant community phenology, so how the timing of life events happen. Um, 
and specifically how phonology changes over uh, between years, but then also the factors that change the rate uh, within a single year. Um, another big thing, another big part of our project is scaling up me measurement methodologies in Tundra systems. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the systems that we have in place that allow us to do that. And then uh, my own pet projects are looking at cryptogams, so your mosses and your lichens, and the roles that they play in tundra ecosystems, because they often uh, are, they're often overlooked in the research, but they play a very important role. OK. So, um, so these are just a couple pictures uh, showing kind of what we do. We are associated with the ITEX network, the International Tundra Experiment, the uh, pictures of the open top chambers from Barrow in the lower left. Um, and then the right two images are of the MISP system, which I'm going to explain in just a second. So the specific, um, so the, the specific role of our project is to kind of bridge the gap between what's called plot scale vegetation assessment, which is highly precise, um, where you're looking at small plots, uh, often a meter by a meter size. And they're, so like I said, they're highly precise, but they're very time and labor intensive. And sometimes it's difficult to extrapolate out to the larger landscape scale. And then in the past few decades, we've had uh, satellite images. Satellite imagery has really came into its own um, for large-scale monitoring, but there's also uh, inherent issues with that as well because you have uh, lower uh, spatial and temporal resolution in that um, oftentimes a, a pixel on a satellite image can on, might only be a kilometer by a kilometer. So there's a lot of uh, things that are going on within that square. And things like cloud cover, how often the satellites fly over a certain area can lower that resolution. And so what we have is a system called the Mobile Instrument and Sensor Platform, or MISP, and that allows us to kind of bridge that gap between the two. Um, this is a, an example, a mock-up of the uh, Tulip Lake transect for the MISP system. And so what it is is uh, approximately 50 meter by uh, 2 meter uh, transect that spans the, common, the dominant community types within a system. So we have dry heath, which are mostly dominated by lichens and very short statured shrubs and forbs. We have shrub um, communities, which are dominated by your taller statured shrubs. And then on the left-hand side, you'll see the moist acidic, which is uh, dominated by Iriophorum vaginatum. Uh, this is your classic tussock tundra. All three of these are very dominant here. And so that's why we have our system set up to be able to monitor how each of those communities change. And the MISP system uh, is set up so that it, what it does is uh, it has a, I'm not going to go through all these instruments, <laughs> but we do a lot of reflectance stuff. We do a lot of thermal imagery. We do 3D camera. We look at albedo. And the idea is that uh, we're matching the same things that are on a satellite but at a much smaller scale. And so that's more of the remote sensing. And I will let Matthew tell you more about the phonology. Hey, guys. Um, Matthew here. Um, I just graduated recently with my undergrad um, last year. And this is my second year working with the same lab up here in uh, Alaska. Um, my research here involves working a lot with phonology or any phenological changes changes by our plots and occasionally um, run the tram system. And uh, I also have some uh, side projects involving flowers and uh, thrips. I'll probably talk about thrips a little bit later on. So more or less, our, we have 12 phonology plots up there by that hill, right up, well, we can't see it in the webcam. Um, we have uh, 12 plots, and each plot has eight different species that we look at. There's more species, but 
we specifically look at, look at the changes, you know, how they grow out, how they flower, when they start to senesce or die out. And over here, you can see, see two of the species that we look at. The top one is Cassiope, and the bottom one is Canary Often Flower. And also, on the left, there's me on top of Jade Mountain, which, unfortunately, you can't see behind me, because that's the top of the mountain. Yes. Um, and I'm, th I'm there, and I was also collecting a couple of flower samples so that we can, you know, test the reflectance on the petals and the uh, sepals. And uh, I'll let Melissa take over from here on. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, that's the team. We're, we're a small but uh, effective team. Um, uh, so when I got to uh, Alaska in, on June 4th, uh, I actually started in Barrow. And so this is a map of the two main areas I've been is Barrow. And sorry, <laughs> people are going out to the field, so the helicopter's kind of loud. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, so Barrow is at the top uh, of, the, of the state there. Um, and then Tulick Field Station is where that star is. It's on the Dalton Highway, off, just off the Dalton Highway. Yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, the pointer. Um, just south of Prudhoe Bay, Dead Horse. It's kind of, uh, that's about 200 or so miles south of the Dead Horse. Um, so when I started, I was in uh, Utgalvik, uh, or Barrow, in 2016. They, they uh, uh, voted to go back to their, their native name, which means place where we dig up roots. So... Um, in that top right corner, yes, there. Um, this picture is a picture of um, the BARC, or the Barrow Arctic Research Center. And uh, in the, uh, uh, the Barrow transect uh, is out on the BEO, or the Barrow Experimental Observatory. And then this group uh, also has uh, a tower out at Epcosook, which is about 60 miles south of, of Barrow. And those are uh, the team that was up there, some GVS few people there. So uh, some of you are watching. So, um, then uh, while in Barrow, um, it was really snowy. So basically all we got to do was uh, set up the tram. Didn't actually get to run it because there was, depending on different where you were on the transect, it could be anywhere from four feet to like, you know, maybe a foot of snow. So too much snow to run the machine, uh, to run the uh, mist, but uh, yeah, but we did get to do some snow machining, so that was super fun. Um, never did that. Did some training on ATVs, and since couldn't do couldn't do a lot with phenology since you couldn't see the plants, um, was able to go out with uh, Noah Ashley, and so that's the long spur wrangling. We. Uh, we trapped some, some birds there, so that's a, a female long spur that I'm holding. Uh, that was actually a good day because, you know, it was field work, but we were working inside of the truck, so it was still warm. Um, but that was really cold. Um, and then the bottom center is uh, I got to be able to be a tourist for a day in, in Barrow and check out the uh, Nupiat, uh Heritage Center and just kind of see the town and meet some of the people and the artists, and it was, it was really a fun experience. Um, then I got to Tulik, and Tulik is a University of Alaska uh, Fairbanks facility. Um, the uh, the buildings are are modular. Um, they uh, the top right is uh, Weatherport City. That's where um, yeah, that's where the residents live. And that was a cold that was actually snowing that day when I took that picture. Um, and then over. Here, uh, this is the dining hall uh, and main offices. And in the center is this, this is the community center. This is actually the back of the building. We're behind this building right now. Um, they, like last night, we had a uh, talk and shop um, where one of the uh, researchers uh, was just talking about his work that he does here at Tulick with, with the lake. Um, and then this is Lab 4. This is where we do all of our inside science stuff, which we've had a lot of inside days here. So it's been really good to uh, get out and be outside. Because when you're outside, you get to see all of these cool animals. Um, right now, there is a camp fox who is kind of keeping the ground squirrel population down for us. But um, 
he's pretty cute and pretty awesome. And uh, we uh, tried to snag one of the uh, nicer days and go do a berry uh, survey, but uh, a couple of grizzlies changed our minds. And, and then, you know, there's the caribou. I said caribou, but I did not. For them. And so there's the caribou uh, along the Dalton Highway. And there's been a herd of muskox with babies along the Dalton Highway, too. That's been really cool to watch. Um, the moose, this is actually a picture from Matthew. Um, I have not seen a moose uh, here, but uh, they, they are here. Uh, and then ptarmigan. Ptarmigan. Um, prairie chicken. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, ptarmigan there. And uh, there's the ground squirrel. So um, there are some of them. Like there were two of them just a minute ago over off off camera wrestling over something. Who knows? Um, and this is a Jaeger, which they are really cool to watch to fly because they just kind of hover and, and in the air and just don't get close to the nest because then they're kind of mean. Um, and then this right here, this little guy, that's a long spur. So there's tons of those little songbirds around. Um, they seem to be everywhere. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these plants, but you can tell um, the plants here are pretty uh, small in stature. Um, and if you kind of look overall uh, the landscape, it looks like there's not a lot of variety. Um, but there is just a ton of different types of, of, of plants that are and, uh Lichens and mosses, they're just, they're just everywhere, and there's so many different kinds. Um, haven't seen the, uh, very many wildflowers yet with the snow cover, so hopefully that will start soon. But um, that was, uh, so that's all, that up there where the green arrow is, that's a lichen, Dactylina arctica, Dact arctica, Dactylina arctica. I'm getting there. Um, so, yeah, and I just posted yesterday a, uh, a post about uh, the eight focus species on the phenology plot, so I encourage you to go and read that journal entry to, you know, learn what these plants are. That's a night off run that Matthew mentioned earlier, so, um, yeah, so lots of flowers, lots of animals, um, and the weather has been kind of chaotic, it seems. Um, the first two weeks was a lot like this. Uh, first two weeks was a lot like that, um, a lot of white on white, with gray clouds. Um, but the last couple of days, it's been more more sunny, and the snow melts very quickly up here once, once the sun does come out. It, it goes fast. So it's been a little unusual, but I'm over halfway through my Polar Trek experience and haven't had to don the bug shirt once. So that's been good. Oh, thanks for sharing that link there. Um, so we're hopeful for more days this where we can get out into the field and enjoy and enjoy the tundra. And I think we're back to the I yeah. Um, yeah, I think we have a um, a couple questions that you might as well answer now because they related to like what you were uh, kind of going through before we go to the next part. If that's okay. Okay, so the first one was from uh, Gabrielle. Uh, what's your favorite part of Alaska? My favorite part of Alaska? We all answering this? I don't know. <laughs> favorite part? Um, so far, I think um, it's just all of the new experiences. Uh, you know, Barrow is very different from Tulip. Um, as far as your experiences in Barrow, you get a lot of native culture. Um, you know, the Arctic Ocean is literally across the street from where we were, uh, where we uh, were working out of. So, um, you know, it's it's just it's very it's just different um, than Tulip, um, and they are both uh, amazing in their own way. So yeah, I'm I just everything is so new that I'm not sure if I could pick something that was truly my one single favorite thing. So yeah, just all of the new experiences, the new equipment that I'm getting to experience and use, and the new landscapes um, that are so varied. And from you know just walking 10 meters, you're in a totally different ecosystem. So um, it's it's really amazing up here. 
you want to hear from all of us? Or? No, it's okay. Okay. Um, uh, and they can pipe in any time. It's either way. Uh, the Cabrera family would like to know how cold does it get? Um, it's been the coldest. It's been the coldest that it's been recently has been in the low twenties at night. Uh, we had a couple of days when Matthew and I first arrived in late May that was in the upper teens, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty low for this time of year. Uh, but in winter, you know, there's it's nothing for them to get 50, 60 below uh, stretches. But normally during the summer, it's right around freezing at night and then gets up in the 50s and 60s during the day. I can't really answer All right. that well because it's been unusual weather every single day since I've been up here. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's a norm in Alaska, really. Um, so related to weather, um, Angela D. says, are these two photos in the same place? And did the snow melt that fast? Yeah, OK. So snow, to the first question, that first, the snow picture, um, this one is actually in Barrow. It's a coastal plain. Um, so like there's no hills. There's no, it's very flat. Um, but that's where there was the most snow. So that was actually, that's actually in Barrow. And then this picture is in Tulick. Um, but when I first arrived at Tulick, it was all snow covered as well. Um, but yeah, it, it melts really fast. Um, I, I'm surprised at how quickly because um, the sun's, even though it's out 24 hours a day, it's not very intense, but I'm surprised at how um, how fast it melts the snow up here. So um, I would say, like, once it stopped snowing and the, and the sky cleared, it took it maybe a couple of days for it to clear out to be like that picture and we could run it. Okay. Um, actually, I think the last two questions got answered, which was, Somebody, uh, Wendy was asking about when does the sun reappear in Barrow, and the answer came from Caitlin. The first sunset in Barrow is August 1st. And Mike Penn was asking if you are experiencing 24 hours of daylight, and you answered that question as well. Tomorrow's the solstice, so 24. So, yeah, so let's, um, we'll, we'll continue on with the, uh, starting with this eye text. Okay. So we are part of the Aon ITEX, which is the Arctic Observatory or Arctic Observing Network, um, which is a division of NSF funding. Uh, but we're a part of the Greater International Tundra Experiment, which is a circumpolar network of researchers. I think it has 19 institutions around the Arctic now, and. Uh, that are doing all the same thing that are allowing us to scale up our measurements uh, to look at how climate change is affecting specifically plant communities. And Dr. Steve Oberbauer is the lead PI for our group, for our project um, at Florida International University. He is enjoying warm and sunny Miami right now while the rest of us are in the Arctic. Um, Okay, so I already explained to you kind of what the MISP is and that we use to, to uh, collect our data. Uh, and it's the bridge between those on the ground, the eyes on the ground, the actual measuring of leaf, uh, measuring of grass blades, um, and then the satellites in space and aerial photography. Uh, we're moving into, uh, we've had kite photography, kite photography for a while but we're starting to move into drone photography. Actually, here at Tulip, we just flew the drones for the first time about three days ago. Um, but so the, what's important about the, the MIST system is that we're doing it on a near daily basis. And so we're getting really high uh, temporal or time resolution measurements that match the satellite. So we're essentially ground truthing so we can our uh, the satellite and aerial photography images in order to bridge that gap as best as possible. And then all of our data is shared uh, open source online. Uh, anybody can get to it. Um, 
and that way they can use it for their measurements or to fill out their studies or for long-term monitoring as well. And then a little more specifics about phenology, and I will give you back to Mr. Simon. Hey guys. So I mentioned before that when it comes to phenology, we actually have to look at the individual changes that happen to these species. So as you can see, uh, phenology is basically the study of the life cycle events and how they're influenced by bi biological and physical factors. These factors could be anything ranging from wind, the amount of sun, even permafrost depth. So when we actually go over there, we take several readings. We First of all, we actually physically look at these plants in you know plot level. Then we take the NDVI, or essentially how green they are, and green and happy. We also take a reflective, reflective measurements using the unispec. And we also take thaw depth, which is basically a metal probe that goes down. We can see how deep or or less how much permafrost is actually from the plot to the actual like uh, ground. Because everything that we measure can affect uh, phenology. So climate change and phenology. Yeah. Uh, hello. <laughs> so, um, my, my hope with, uh, with this program and what I'm doing up here is to be able to take back to my classroom um, a deeper understanding of how um, climate change uh, is affecting phenology. Uh, you know, a warming planet creates these changes in these phenological events that, um, you know, if the plants are blooming earlier, if they're going through their, uh, their cycles uh, at different times and then dissipated, that can throw off um, even for base of ecosystems that can throw off an entire have a, a cascade effect that affects other um, plants and animals as well. Um, for example, a lot of birds will time laying their eggs at a specific time because they know by the time the chicks hatch, there will be enough insect larvae uh, about around and about to feed their chicks. Um, but if the insect larvae are emerging sooner because it's warmer, that's going to be throwing off um, their ability to there in the summer. Um, so um, that, that's kind of what I'm, I'm wanting to bring back. Uh, the, the intensity of the, the weather changes up here are very extreme. So you extreme. need to come, Melissa. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Melissa. Yeah, you need to get closer to the yeah. mic. You need to get closer to the mic. Yeah, it's hard to hear you. Got it. Thanks. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the whole point of my being up here was to be able to bring these experiences back to my classroom. So um, with the extreme weather, uh, the unusual weather that we're having, it's, it's allowed me to do a little extra slide research about um, the importance of the Arctic climate to the rest of us. Um, because whatever is the Arctic uh, weather uh, eventually becomes our weather in the lower 48. So we should really pay a lot of attention <laughs> to how weather is being affected and changing up here because it uh, dramatically and um, significantly impacts our, our weather um, down in the, the middle, latitude, middle latitude. So, um, you know, so that's what I'm hoping to be able to bring back to my classroom is that connection and that storyline. And I think that's all I have. So. Okay, there's some uh, questions that came up while you were talking. So let's see, I'm going to kind of go through here. Um, so from Wendy, is there radioactive material releasing out of the tundra like some places in Russia? And do you share your data freely with Russian scientists so, as uh, well? Answer the second question first. Yeah, so we have, anyone can go on and just go on the internet assuming that they're not blocked to get to our website from Russia. Um, you can go and access our database and it has my contact information as well um, as the point of contact in order to, uh, so if anyone has any questions about our data or needs clarification on exactly timing or what we've been actually measuring. Now, as far as radioactive, not that I'm aware of, um, uh, there is a there there are people studying the release of uh, methane and carbon dioxide from the 
uh, permafrost as it thaws, um, which is a big deal in its own right because the tundra is essentially a very, very large frozen swamp. And so there's a lot of carbon that's locked up in the, in the soils. And as things warm, then microbial activity increases and things are broken down. And that carbon that's been stored for thousands of years in the soil is released into the, into the system, into the atmosphere. And so there's what's called uh, positive feedback in that as the climate warms, more permafrost thaws, which causes more release of these uh, gases and which warms the climate more. And then it causes more uh, thawing. And yeah, so you just get this positive feedback that kind of pushes the whole system into a new uh, uh, into a new normal, I guess. Uh, we'll see. Okay, awesome, thanks. Um, so, let's see, for Mike Penn, how is this year's bloom as compared to average or 30 years ago? Um, so, in general, uh, what our research has found is that the timing of the blooming of flowers has actually uh, moved earlier. And it's moved earlier, I think, by five days is the, uh, is the, the movement um, at our specific sites. However, this year is abnormal. Um, in the past four years that I've been at Tulik, we should be in full bloom. We should have flowers everywhere right now. And right now, there, there are uh, the shrubs, the salix uh, species, are just now starting to put out their leaves. Um, they flower pretty early, but they um, there are a lot of uh, species that haven't even haven't even uh, greened out yet, haven't even put out leaves. And so we're looking for mid July um, as far as the timing of those flowers coming out, as opposed to the past couple years where it's been mid June. So we're almost a month behind. So I'm um, kind of a follow-up. So what do you anticipate, Jeremy? What's it going to look like for, um, I don't know, you know, uh, next summer when you come, if you get such a delayed delayed start this year with flower blooming? Yeah. Or what's going to happen to the birds and the bees? Um, I don't, I'm not quite sure, actually. Um, so Steve, the PI on our project, uh, published a paper a few years ago that says that it doesn't really matter when uh, for the plants as far as like when they actually uh, when they flower the timing of flowering so they have um, kind of an, a distinct uh, period where if they start in June they end in early August if they start in July they start in they end in late August and so they're kind of programmed for a uh, a set number of days that their light, their their yearly phenology takes. Now, what happens in years like this uh, is more of what Melissa was talking about and the cascading effect across the uh, trophic level. So, for the insects and for the uh, for the birds, a couple years ago, for example, we had a year where things really got going strong, fast, and early. And there were lots of mosquitoes out. The birds came up. They were happy because they showed up on time. And then we got this um, uh, variation in temperature where we had a few days where it froze. And a lot of the bird uh, nests were actually abandoned. And so that was actually quite detrimental to uh, a lot of the bird species up here. So they just lost an entire uh, a round of uh, babies. So we'll see. Um, as far as the plants go, most of our plants are, are 95 percent of our plants are uh, perennials. So they will just maybe not set seed this year. And they'll just uh, conserve some of their resources and hope for better luck next year.
All right, very interesting. Um, before I move on to, let's see, let's, uh, Wendy asked, uh, because we are just still talking about flora there, um, what kinds of bugs help pollinate the flowers there? Great question for Matt. <laughs> go back well, we actually it. have some, well, not tons, but we have a lot of, oh, you can hear me? We actually have a lot of species that can actually pollinate these flowers. We have bumblebees, wasps, and, of course, what I'm studying right now, thrips. Now, fun fact, since we're in the Arctic, these wasps and mosquitoes, excuse me, wasps, also mosquitoes can pollinate too. These wasps and bumblebees are huge compared to like what you would normally see. So, and they get pretty busy, especially right before the snow hit. They just start pollinating like crazy. Thrips, on the other hand, which is what I'm studying right now, they're like these small little aphid-like beetles that you can pretty much find anywhere throughout the Arctic, right? There's been research uh, done to show that these thrips actually pollinate uh, several species of salix and um, any plant really that depends on wind pollination. What's kind of sad though is that these strips are usually detrimental, but they're still pollinators and these plants still depend on them even though, you know, they eat their buds, their catkins, or their leaves. So to answer your question, several species, there's also, from my understanding, several species of birds that actually pollinate. Of, again, through wind pollination and some of the pollen that gets latched onto their feather, it just re, um, gets pushed out and hopefully collected by another species. So, yeah. Sorry. Uh, all right. Um, we have a question from Arctic staff. How long is ITEX funded for? Oh, okay. This is, a, this, is a great, this is a great question. Yep. So um, ITEX is... Uh, ITEX was the brainchild of uh, P.J. Weber from Michigan State University. Uh, the original the, the original meeting to discuss it was was in 1990, and the earliest plots were started in the early 90s, like 93, 94. And so, ITEX as a as a uh, community of researchers is not funded as a whole. It's individual researchers. That are that are funding their own projects. So what happens is, so like for our uh, example, we might we're funded uh, actually through this year, and then we put in for uh, another round of funding to extend us out. But there are groups right now that don't actually have any money, so their projects are uh, kind of in a hiatus, if you will. They're still warming the plots. They're still having other people help put out the chambers. To continue the treatment, but if you have a funding gap of a year or two, thing they just won't do any measurements for a couple years, and then they go right back to it uh, when they are able to acquire money. So, like I said, there's 19 institutions. There's about 12 groups of people that are looking for their own individual funding. So there's not uh, overall like block of money that's given for ITEX. If that does that, if that makes sense. Yep, and I posted a few links to various things okay. as you've been talking, you know, like to a poster that was from your website and hopefully to kind of show how complex uh, collaborative projects can be and how spread out, you know, all the partners. So. Um, so from Angela D, we have a question. Does it smell when it melts if it's releasing methane? Um, it, it doesn't. I have, um, occasionally you will get uh, in like some of the lower areas where it's really wet, you get that swampy smell. Um, but for the most part, no. It's not what you would uh, think of as a methane smell unnecessarily. There's a lot of air mixing. And it's releasing it at a relatively slow rate, so and it's uh, the wind is usually fairly strong, so you don't really get that. Um, you do, however, start to see some of the methane or some of the methane mixing with water, especially in Barrow, um, and you can see like almost like an oily look on top of the water in uh, puddles. Yeah, and I've seen methane um, 
you know, researchers light it out when it comes bubbling out of the pond in the middle of the winter. That's exciting. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Another question um, from Katie Lodes. Are the birds and the pollinator, oh, no, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I made her mistake because <laughs> I read it. Um, are the flowers and pollinators in sync? So is the temperature that triggers flowering and the pollinators hatching out or light or a combination? It's a, yeah, it's a combination. So are they in sync? It's a combination. Okay. So the nice thing Go about uh, the, the benefit of the Arctic being that you only have three months of the year to do anything um, because the other nine months it's frozen, you end up with uh, things are pretty locked into place uh, as far as uh, in sync. Um, sometimes, however, if you get a, like a couple years ago where we got a big burst of early, early spring, so like late April uh, thaw, then the, all the flowers were able to take advantage of that before before the uh, the ground was frozen, because most of these insects have their eggs in the ground, and so if it warms up really fast and the snow melts off, the plants will take advantage of that and use uh, reserves that they have to start flowering and, uh, you know, starting their their yearly cycles. Whereas if it's if it's that ice if it if the warming happens very quickly, the ice will take longer in the soil to thaw. And so you can get a mismatch. And that year, we actually saw many less uh, berries formed because those pollinators weren't there. And then on a side note, it also, we had a snowstorm in June that year, which once the pollinators were even out, ended up killing a bunch of them. So that was a very bad berry year. All right, nice. Um, are there any other questions out there? We're getting some thank yous. Um, and thank you for the earlier ones. Oh, um, are the drones giving good photos? Yeah, yeah. So the drones that uh, we're that we're using uh, in association with the the uh, GIS office here at Tulick. They do give great photos. And in Barrow and Akasuk, the kite photography, um, they give great aerial, or aerial images of the transect. So the transect would be in the center of the image, and then you get a much wider air, uh, uh, extent to the photo. And so we can do some NDVI mapping or some greenness mapping that allows us to uh, you know, kind of scale up our measurements. But yeah, they, uh, they're high resolution cameras, so we get some great photos. And I, I, during the times that one of the, you know, a researcher might be standing under those photos, it also makes for uh, pretty good photos for presentations and things. So. <laughs> nice, yeah. we like good photos. All right. I'm looking to see if anybody else has questions, but um, it looks pretty good. Let's see, Wendy says, do any of the locals grow any particular crops there? And I don't know, uh, Wendy, if you're talking about Tulik or up at Usiagvik. Yeah, so like you know, most of the plants here are edible, like there's not any toxicity really in any of the plants, so you can eat much any of the vegetation and I think that a lot of the native cultures are more hunter-gatherer kind um, they're not uh, they're very subsistence living um, whatever's in season that's what they eat and that's what they they, they get so yeah there's no no crops um, being grown up here they, they don't have gardens and such it's such a short growth I, I think it would render it impossible there's been there's been a little bit of research um, done at, in some of the uh, the more southerly villages that are still within the Arctic Circle, um, where they tried to grow corn in greenhouses um, with limited success. But 
that those projects kind of ended in, I believe, the 90s. Um, but yeah, like Melissa was saying, that uh, a lot of the crops are, or a lot of the the, uh, the food source is either hunting, fishing, or uh, traditionally like berry collecting, root collecting, things like that. But in the modern, you know, in the past, in the modern times, uh, most of the food is actually shipped in, which is one of the famous things about uh, Ukviagvik is that how expensive it is because everything has to be shipped in on a plane. So you get your $14 bottles of juice and stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As somebody was asking about greens and greenhouses, uh, I was typing that there was an interesting story. Um, there's a couple of entrepreneurs in rural Alaska that have converted the container boxes, yeah. the shipping boxes that you see around, um, to uh, in uh, greenhouses, and they're experimental at this stage, but they're turning out to be pretty good, and they're supplying um, some local uh, year-round crops to people. Um, so let's see, um, and this might be our last question before we sign off here for you, Melissa. What has been the most interesting meal you've had in Alaska? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the most interesting meal I almost had, um, and I say almost because um, the the CPS representative at uh, in Barrow at Ukavik, she came running into the dining hall where a lot of us were working and said, they're giving away whale meat. So we jumped into the truck and uh, went down to where they were, where the whaling boat was, but it was like 20 minutes later and it was all gone already. So um, I almost almost had that, but I would say, I mean, the food here is just, you know, I hate to say it, but it's like what you would get at home, so um, it's fantastic, it's wonderful, and, um, you know, the baked goods, especially at Tulik, I mean, come on, it's fantastic, but, um, but in Barrow, um, yeah, like, ate at a sushi restaurant the first night, so, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> um, I, I wish that I, I could have said that I, I had more of the uh, traditional local uh, cuisine, but uh, you know they really do very much live very closely to what we what we live in the lower 48. It's it's not uh, reindeer and whale meat every night. So <laughs> um, yeah, so I. I my, what I think is most interesting is just, you know, the availability of, of everything you would expect to be able to get at home. Oh, yeah, on the candy wall. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Wendy. Very good. Uh, so uh, Mark wants to know, have you noticed any vegetation growing in the research area that was not there when you first began your research? Kind of uh, changing. So, and, and Mark, um, that sorry, that is that is that's a great thing. So in the past, uh, so I, like I said, I've been coming up for 11 years, and the project's been going on for in the 20s. Um, it's not that there are necessarily more uh, or new species coming in. It's really a shift in the dominance of those species. Mm -hmm. So it used to be that uh, the lichens, the mosses, and the forbs. Are were the dominant species, and with warming, you have this idea of shrubification or grassification, and so what you have are these taller, uh, taller statured things like your shrubs and your grasses, your graminoids, uh, that are able to move in, and uh, once they move in, then they start to outcompete those shorter species, and so you're getting a shift from mosses and lichens. Um, to shrubs and grasses, which changes the dynamic of the system, which is one aspect of what people are really focusing on here, because that changes uh, how quickly the the active layer or the permafrost thaws. That changes uh, what the the hydrology of the system, and then 
Uh, so all those things kind of play into each other, and that's one of the major focuses here. So it's not really new stuff coming in necessarily, because while the Arctic is warming, and there is evidence of that, it's still harsh, right? You can't get a lot of temperate species that are going to just move up here. Um, instead, you just get a shift from one, uh, the winners and the losers, if you will. That was a great question. <laughs> all right. Yeah, it was. Very good question. Um, all I can tell you, Melissa, is that you better write a journal or something about a candy wall here because Mike and Wendy are just yammering on about a candy wall. Um, it is a candy wall. So it really is about two or three shelves full of it. So they they said they need a picture of it. Right. They need evidence. So. Be sure to include that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, we really uh, thank you guys for hanging um, out there in the wide open world and doing this webinar with us and spotting mosquitoes. I love the uh, the effects. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm uh, glad that the field season is now progressing, <laughs> that the snow is melted, and that there's actually vegetation starting to uh, uh, come out. That's good. Um, we will um, stop the recording here in a little bit, but if your questions didn't get answered, feel free to post them to Melissa, and she'll be happy to respond to them. And uh, we wish you all the best of a good rest of your field season and time in Alaska. Thanks.